As we all know, there are many ways to travel, some a lot better than others. This was one of the first we considered and ruled out. Travel by oxen is like an ocean cruise. You need a lot of time. With only six days at our disposal, we had to cover 1,200 miles each way and still leave three or four for fishing. A mighty tight schedule. Henry argued for the oxen, but we overruled him in a very democratic vote. See that airplane? That's ours. And she's going to take us to northern Saskatchewan. But more about that later. The commercial jet coming in doesn't mean a thing. Henry was just tuning up his trigger finger. Couldn't wait to start shooting some footage. To get back to the ox cart, better ways to travel. Clarence Nissen was the only member of our party who owned an airplane. So we made it a point to get to know him pretty well. Finally one day he said, Okay, you bums, let's go. He didn't have to ask us twice. So here we are at Mitchell Field in Milwaukee. Now we're airborne. And we got a nice six out of our takeoff, but because we forgot to board the plane, Clarence had to come back for us. Let's take a look at the map to give you an idea of the route we'll take and the distance to the northern part of that Canadian province. We're not going to fly non-stop, not with the load you represent and the cruising speed of only 145 miles an hour. We'll stop four or five times, mostly to refuel and also to go through customs of Winnipeg. We'll be heading up through Manitoba for most of the trip, then crossing the Saskatchewan just before reaching our destination, Hatchet Lake. After a brief refueling stops at Duluth, Winnipeg, Dauphin, and La Paz, we put down at Lynn Lake, a little mining town near the 57th parallel in western Manitoba. The railroad terminates there, and the highways peter out some distance south. We got out to stretch and look around. Since there wasn't much to see, we climbed back aboard again and took off. Clarence calls his airplane the widget. We suspect it's named that because he misunderstood the salesman who was trying to sell him a four-passenger amphibian called the Pigeon. Clarence checks his heading stuck a wet finger out the window for a weather reading, pointed the widget's nose for Hatchet Lake, some 135 miles northwest of the still goes. Did you ever see so much water? A lot of that down there is reindeer lake, these rugged basins, and must have been chewed out ages ago by a monstrous glacier. It's about 100 miles long and 25 miles wide as Broadus Park. You have to see a detailed map of this area to appreciate the staggering number of lakes, big and small, dotting the landscape for hundreds of miles in any direction. That's about all we did see along our route. Always oh, spotted an occasional building which seemed so out of place in that virgin country, and we wondered, a little shack, abandoned mine, trading post, or what? Did people actually live down there? Amazing. We no more than cross reindeer when we approach another big lake, Wallace. That's good. We're on course and almost there. Clarence set the widget down like a feather. Maybe more like a duck. Hatchet is a 15 by 10 mile extent of cold, clear water. The 
presumably teeming with lake trout. We hope so because there's not much else to go with the scenery. No electricity, telephone, television, central heating, not even a real estate sale. Nothing but miles and miles and miles and miles. So this is our hatchet lake. Unspoiled by civilization. Natural as the day she was formed and probably never floated a water skier. We're just below the 59th parallel and about level with the middle of Hudson Bay. So we know we're up north and then come. The facilities consist of five rough hewn cabins and a dining cabin, all pretty primitive. Red Fleming, who came from Scotland years ago, runs the place. And there's our wicked sitting there in her shore berth. We really run it. Pretty obvious when you see that cabin. She's sturdy enough, but compliments stop there. There's no running water, and the heat is provided by an old wood burner that has to be fired all night long. Please stop, Kenneth. Singleton. Followed by Clarence Mitten. Henry Sturdy. Henry's our photographer, so don't ask me how he pulled this off. He's got to be a team. Sorry about the lighting in the restaurant, folks, but you get the idea. If you look sharp, you can spot Bob and Clarence taking out some nourishment. We heard an engine overhead and looked up to see a float plane coming in for a landing on Hatchet. It was a bush pilot bringing fishermen from Lake Larong, more than 200 miles south. You have to love your work to be a bush pilot, because flying in that country leaves no room for pump of air or equipment failure. A forced landing can be crippled. Even if you get down in one piece, because a disabled plane is all but impossible to spot in the air. This is home. Singleton hangs up a few things as Bob lays down his feet. You'll note the severity of the furnishing. You might even call the day player thoroughly rough and ready. Man, it was earthy in those cabins, and colder than a well bigger backside. For what? If we had wanted luxury, we'd have checked in at the Belmont down on Fort and Wells, Milwaukee. Down to breakfast, and eating plates with eggs, sausage, and bacon, and pancakes, and pie, and toast, and cereal, and appetite equal to the challenge. Strange, but you tend to eat more heartily when you get up in the bush far from home and civilization. In plain English, we make pigs of ourselves. Back in our cabin, Bob and Singleton wiggle into the wet weather here. All it was past mid-June, it was chilly, with air temperatures ranging from below freezing to maybe 50 on a warm day. The lake temperature was probably in the 30s. We were told the lake still had a lot of ice on it until the previous week. That float plane moved the pier was operated by the wrong aviation service. Bob and Clarence start off for his morning fishing. He never used live bait, only daredevil filled his spoon, which seemed especially attractive to lakers. Slow trolling proved effective, but we varied our techniques by casting occasionally. Now and then we could thank a hungry northern. If they were badly outnumbered by lake trout, there for the taking. 
bag limit was about six fish a day per person, as I recall. Remember, we had no difficulty at two. Our biggest single fish weighed about 12 pounds, with most trout in the 5 to 10 pound range. Not bad. Our guide and chief cook remover is Joe, who is half Cree Indian. He winters about well, 300 miles east of here in Churchill on the western shore of Hudson's Bay. He canoed and portage from the bay to half the lake of the young man who was 20 years ago. Next came one of the most delightful chapters of our adventure, preparing a shore lunch of our fresh catch about me. Let me tell you, fish from that clean and cold lake waste of the best that I need to be a fish, fowl, or fruit. Still helped out here too, and the fire blazing in no time. That big iron skillet, no doubt, was beside a thousand or more instructed on fillers, and is ready for further serving. Our cash was so good that we stuffed ourselves, and still took some back to camp. The worst part of a shore lunch is learning to say no, some of these had another. Believe me, it's hard to stop.
How'd that dog get here? It's a long way from the ocean, or even from Hudson Bay. Those birds can smell a meal a mile away. go again. This time he can study single style while the old handles the motor. Baby starts to patrol. There they do. Each inset leaves having to stop the go again. I might also mention that we didn't have to stage any of this fish attack and make this movie look good. Henry never had to wait very long either to get those catches on film. Clarence and Bob are trying their luck in the other boat. Bob has made lots of fishing trips and ranks his experience at Hunter's Lake with the best of them. mentioned that the lake trout who came this part of camp is the biggest member of the trout family and catch is exceeding 50 pounds. To get a bit pedantic for a minute, the laker prefers a deep and cold habitat and water with a high oxygen content. Don't ask me why. As soon as the water starts to warm up in the spring, you'll find him near the surface. Once the lake is warm, however, he gets to the depth. A 
as you see, we didn't eat it all. There's plenty left. Bob and Clarence fill the ice chest with the balance of the day's catch. I don't remember how much we brought back to the state, but it was a lot. Thanks to the convenience of the home freezer, we ate fish for a long, long time. This was the last time we fished Hatchet Lake. There goes Singleton in his wetsuit. I think he's got his heart set on a real trophy. Strange that none of us in the lake are weighing more than 12 pounds. Not that we're complaining, but you'd think that in four days' time, someone would score with a 25 to 30 pounder. Well, it's not that important. On the other hand, lakers caught in shallow water in early summer put up a better fight than those hooked at 200 feet in midsummer. The change in water pressure as a laker is brought up from the deep takes much of the fight out of him. Although he's a fine battler in the shallows, for some unknown reason he doesn't break water after being hooked. That's their style, I suppose. Notice the fog? fact of the matter is, we were scheduled to take off that morning, but got stocked in instead. We took advantage of, of the delay to hop in our boat for another crack at the trout. again. We've caught our last trout and hatchet, unless the bad weather delays us longer. <laughs> Bob did all right, didn't he? Scored with four dandies. Clean them up, boys. Our widgeons raring to go. Incidentally, all garbage has to be evacuated to a nearby island to discourage the bears from raiding our camp. So fish leavings aren't just left on the ground. Red seeds and everything is picked up and bagged. The coolers are loaded into the widgeon. That precious cargo boat. Okay, take her up, Clarence. We want to get home and start bragging about all those Lakers that didn't get away. It's a Saturday, June 22nd. We arrived on Monday night the 17th. Had four dull days of fishing and now we're going home. There's our camp down there. Kind of forlorn and lonesome looking from the air, as you might say. But a fisherman's paradise out on the lake. It's a shame more people don't have a shot at this kind of adventure. The lakes around here abound in game fish, and 
doubtless tolerate considerably more efficient pressure than they're getting. And it's obvious why the airplanes working in the North Country are mostly float or amphibian types. There seems to be more water than land. We've crossed Wollaston, Reindeer Lakes again, and have reached Moon Lake, first real town on the homeward route. It's a comforting feeling in a way to be headed back to civilization. After all, we didn't take a bath all the while we were in camp, and our clothes have gotten a trifle gaining. Since we're all in the same boat, or airplane, it makes no difference. We've got the fish, and we've had the kind of trip we never forget. 2,400 miles, four days of fun, all in six days. Thanks, Orville and Wilbur, for making it all possible. Here's good old Mitchell Field and home. We hope you enjoyed this much as you did.